Hi, this is Dr. Mike Ruscio, and you've likely heard of this recent study that found no correlation between serotonin levels and depression. However, this study has been miscontextualized, so let's break down this study, what it found, and most importantly, how the results of this study change the way we think about treatment of depression. So the study was published in the Journal of Molecular Psychiatry, and it found that there was no correlation between serotonin and depression. Was this a good study? It was an excellent study. As an umbrella meta-analysis, it's probably the best data point that we have that will examine the totality of the evidence of serotonin and depression. What is an umbrella, uh, umbrella meta-analysis? Well, if you have a clinical trial, that clinical trial can be summarized into a meta-analysis. So if there were, let's say, 10 clinical trials, those clinical trials could then be summarized into one meta-analysis. And what the meta-analysis does is it allows you to see what is the aggregate finding from those 10 clinical trials. But what if there's a vast body of literature and let's say there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of clinical trials. Therefore, there might be dozens of different meta-analyses. Is there a way for us to take all of those meta-analyses, summarize the meta-analyses into an umbrella meta-analysis? So this is what an umbrella meta-analysis is and why a umbrella meta-analysis is such a compelling piece of data. So in this study, in this umbrella meta-analysis, again, they found no correlation between serotonin levels and depression when they examined 17 meta-analyses of about 165,000 patients. So again, this is a excellent piece of data. Let's break down specifically what they found and then how this may or may not change the way we think about the treatment of depression. Now in this study, again, looking at 17 meta-analyses with probably hundreds of subsidiary clinical trials, there were roughly four main ways in which serotonin is assessed. We can look at it in the blood, we can look at serotonin receptors or binding. We can look at tryptophan, which is the amino acid precursor, which becomes serotonin. And we can also look at serotonin genetics. So I made this simple summary slide to break down what this study found. And let's just talk through it. So again, the four points, plasma serotonin, serotonin in the blood no relationship between blood serotonin levels and depression. Okay, check. What about the 5-HT1A or the 5-hydroxytryptamine receptor or the related binding proteins? Again, here, there was no association or a weak association between receptors and or binding and serotonin. So check and check, consistency here in the finding that there's really no substantial association between serotonin, either plasma, receptors, or binding, and depression. What about tryptophan? Taking a step back, the reason why tryptophan matters is because this is the amino acid or, or essentially protein precursor, which then becomes serotonin. So when you eat food, you digest it down into amino acids. So if people have, let's say, malabsorption, perhaps they're doing a low calorie diet, perhaps they're not eating enough protein dietarily, any of these things may lead to suboptimal levels of tryptophan. And then you can't create enough serotonin because tryptophan is converted into serotonin. So tryptophan has relevancy because it tells us, well, what happens if people are insufficient, again, through changes that they're making in their diet? And remember that tryptophan, 
through tryptophan hydroxylase and then right after that through aromatic acid decarboxylase, essentially the additions that really crudely of a hydrogen and the cleaving of a carbon will take tryptophan and modify the shape so it can then dock into the serotonin receptor or the 5-HT receptor. So this study found that there was no effect in healthy volunteers and only a weak evidence of a correlation between low tryptophan depression in those who had a family history of depression. So again, even with this amino acid precursor to serotonin, there's not really a correlation. Now, one other thing here I want to share with you that gives some relevancy to tryptophan that sometimes uh, I think can skew the conversation to be overly focused on tryptophan is when people are inflamed, tryptophan can be diverted down another pathway. So instead of that tryptophan turning into serotonin, if you're inflamed and if you look at this schematic, you'll see IL-6, IL-1, and TNF-alpha inflammatory cytokines then instead of that tryptophan going to make serotonin, it, go, it goes down this kinin-urinine pathway. However, even though this mechanism is very interesting, what we're seeing in this study is that depletion of tryptophan does not seem to correlate with changes in serotonin that then correlate with depression. So again, this study did not find that tryptophan depletion seemed to correlate with depression, even though there's some really interesting mechanistic findings that tie these together mechanistically, it doesn't seem to impact the outcome of depression. And then finally, what about serotonin genetics? This study looked at serotonin genetics and found no association between serotonin genes or genetics and depression. And also perhaps more importantly, no correlation between genotype, stress, and depression. Now, why this matters is there's this debate of genes or genotype versus phenotype, hardware versus software, if you will, and also the observation that some people will flare upon stress. They may notice they become depressed. They may notice that their IBS flares and they have, let's say, diarrhea, abdominal discomfort, and depression when, again, they're hit with stress. So it begs the question, could there be something from a hardware or from a genetic perspective that predisposes these individuals to depression? And again, the answer here seems to be no. However, there is a, a silver lining to this finding in that the sensitivity to stress may more so be on the phenotypical level, meaning it's the software. So if someone's had traumatic events, this can skew the software and lead one to be more sensitive to stress. And this is where at the clinic, we found certain techniques, most namely the Gupta Limbic Retraining Program from Asha Gupta, who's also been on the podcast and he's published to date two clinical trials to be helpful in allowing patients who notice a stress aversion to then go through some therapy and be able to better tolerate stress. So it's not on the gene level, it's at least seemingly so from partially my inference on the phenotypical level, but that's helpful because you can't really change your genes, but you can change either your phenotype or the software, so to speak. So again, zooming out, this study looked at plasma serotonin. It looked at receptors or binding, tryptophan and genetics. And there was no correlation between any of these measures serotonin, any of these serotonin measures, and depression. And so this leads the researchers to the conclusion, and let's just hop over to the conclusion so you can see it with your own eyes. Here's the study, and the quote, the main areas of serotonin research provide no consistent evidence of there being an association between serotonin and depression and no support for the hypothesis that depression is caused by lowered serotonin activity or concentrations. So pretty clear cut, a very high quality piece of evidence. And we can now say confidently, at least based upon the best data that we currently have, that there's no correlation between these measures of serotonin and depression. However, 
there's more to this story. Before I jump in on that, I want to ask you, what are your thoughts on serotonin and depression? Have you tried therapies to modulate serotonin? Do you notice a correlation between your, let's say, stress and your mood? I'd be very curious to hear in the comments below and also how you've heard this study represented by the media. And this is where I think the story ends in a lot of cases and leads the healthcare consumer to assume, well, because there's no correlation between serotonin and depression, any therapy or any drugs that modulate serotonin are ineffective. This study did not show that. This study did not show that serotonin modulation therapy or drugs are ineffective. This study, an excellent data point it may be, looked at correlation between serotonin measures and depression. It did not look at the efficacy of serotonin treatment. So we should look at this because we don't want to miscontextualize this study and say, and therefore, do not use, let's say, St. John's wort, or do not use any sort of SSRI medication. Not that I'm a huge advocate of serotonin drugs, but we want to report these data objectively so that you as a healthcare consumer can have the conversation with your doctor, look at the risk benefit, side effect profile, and decide if a medication is the right thing for you. So what do the data show for antidepressant medications? Well, let's look at another systematic review with meta-analysis, this time of 432 randomized control trials looking at over 100,000 patients, examining 21 different antidepressant medications. They found a 1.3 to 2.1 imp uh, times improvement over placebo. And the fact that it's over placebo is very important because we know that even when people know they're being given a placebo, they still report benefits. So the power of placebo is substantial. So these drugs do work. Again, as someone who would not recommend this as where to start, we should also be able to say that even though these may not be something that I'm philosophically highly supportive of, it doesn't mean that there's no time and a place, and it doesn't mean that we can misrepresent that earlier study. Because as you can clearly see, this recent meta-analysis did find benefit. This also begs a follow-up question. Well, if these drugs modify serotonin, and we know there's no correlation between serotonin and depression, then how are they working? Well, we may not fully know. The mechanism that we thought was being impacted may not be the primary mechanism or, very important, correlation and intervention data are two separate things. For whatever the reason, we clearly see that patients who are depressed benefit from the use of antidepressant medications. However, we should also provide some juxtaposition to this finding and look at what impact exercise has on depression. And I'd like to share with you here a 2019 systematic review with meta-analysis looking at aerobic training. Now, this is not to say that aerobic training is the best form of training. It's just to provide one data point looking at one type of exercise. Aerobic training for 45 minutes, three times per week for two months had a large effect size on depression. Effect size is the magnitude of benefit. There are some interventions that may document a statistically significant outcome, but it may not be clinically meaningful. The effect size is what helps us delineate that. So in this case, the large effect size means there was a large impact on depression. And what may be happening? How is it that exercise may be improving depression? Well, as a quick aside here, we know that when we track with repeat microbiota or gut bacterial community tests, the health of the gut microbiota over time in sedentary individuals who then start exercising, we see positive shifts in their gut bacteria. We also know that exercise is anti-inflammatory. 
that exercise increases BDN or BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which literally helps the brain fuse better connections between neurons. We know that exercise improves circulation. We also know that some people who exercise will be doing so in nature and that there is a direct therapeutic effect on both mood and energy levels from time in nature. There are endocrine effects like transient, transient increases in things like growth hormone and testosterone. And again, I wanna be careful there because these effects are short-lived and don't appear to have a appreciable impact on let's say your total daily growth hormone or testosterone output, but perhaps these short perturbations in hormones are part of why exercise improves mood. And then finally, and not an exhaustive list here, but exercise will help deplete acetylcholine and help with sleep. So exercise is something that I think we should be considering first before potentially using a medication. And then one other data point here that I found very interesting, all in attempts to provide you the appropriate context for how we think about these different interventions, looking at what's known as the Hamilton Depression Rating Scale, if we look at SSRI medications, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, one study, and this was a meta-analysis of 131 randomized control trials, they found a two-point reduction on depression, which is significant. However, a clinical trial found that sauna therapy led to a four to six point reduction in depression. I also wanna be really careful to state that the SSRI data comes from a meta-analysis of 131 randomized control trials with hundreds of thousands of patients. The sauna study is one clinical trial in about 30 patients. So this is not an apple to apple comparison, but it's just to provide you, if you yourself or someone you love is suffering with depression, the data to understand that there are multiple ways to improve that. And perhaps what we can do is put these in a semi-linear interventional hierarchy, starting with something like exercise and sauna, if you have access to it, amongst other therapies, but just as a few. And maybe if you've had prior trauma, you use some sort of CBT or limbic retraining therapy first. And then if you're not fully seeing the response that you'd like to see, this is when you can check in with your doctor and consider a conversation about antidepressants. Again, context matters. So take this all with a grain of salt, but this is to hopefully help impress upon you that there are many different options for depression. Zooming way out and hopefully tying this all together, the study in question, the umbrella meta-analysis did show that there's no correlation between serotonin and depression. When examining plasma or blood levels, looking at receptors or binding proteins, looking at tryptophan, and looking at genetics. However, this is different than the question, do serotonin modulating SSRI drugs work? They also work. Additionally and finally, remember that things like therapy, exercise, and sauna can also help depression. So all of these things have a time and a place, and hopefully this helps you understand that the medications have not been shown to be ineffective. And if this video has helped you, please share it with a friend. I really do, and we really do rely on sharing of these videos to help the appropriate interpretation of that study to reach the people who may otherwise benefit from using an antidepressant medication, even if only short term. We want to be open to medications, even if we're philosophically opposed to them, because they can help some people. Okay, this is Dr. Michael Ruscio, and hopefully this helps.